Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this special briefing on the HUD anti-trends shelter proposed rule. I am Sabrina Dent and I serve as the Senior Faith Advisor with Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Today's program is brought to you in partnership with our friends at the National Center for Transgender Equality, the National Women's Law Center, and the Center for American Progress. We are grateful for their advocacy and collaboration in this work because it is necessary and important. As a woman of faith whose spiritual practice is love and compassion, I unapologetically affirm the human dignity of every person. I wholeheartedly believe that it takes religious and secular people of moral conscience to speak up and take action to address any and all inhumane practices and policies that threaten our existence as human beings. So that's why we've invited you to be a part of this critical conversation. At Americans United, we believe that true religious freedom is a shield to protect us all and it should never be used as a weapon to cause harm to others. Yet many politicians, including the Trump administration and misguided religious leaders have consistently shown us some different, um, something different by weaponizing our constitutional promise of religious freedom. That is by using it as a tool to discriminate against others, especially transgender people people who are in need of access to reproductive care, as well as racial and religious minorities. However, the team at Americans United is comprised of lawyers, community activists, organizers, policymakers, and religious leaders like me from many cultural, religious, and racial, and gender identities who fight every day for the separation of religion and government which protects religious freedom for all. Today, I hope that you will take the time to listen to the stories and the experiences of our presenters. I want you to listen to the many ways that you and your religious communities can take action by submitting comments to HUD to address this inhumane policy. And I hope that you also will take, uh, take this information on social media and tell people what's happening by using the hashtag housing save lives. With that, I would like to introduce our partner in this work, Dr. Debbie Ojeda Littner, uh, to give remarks on behalf of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Debbie. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Debbie, my pronouns are they, them, and I am the policy advocate for the National Center for Trans Equality. I wanna thank uh, you so much for being here. Um, this is such a pivotal moment in history. I would also love to thank uh, Dr. Sabrina Dent and our awesome panelists, uh, Reverend Cedric Carmon, Reverend Alex Patchen McNeil, Reverend Cherise Char Scott, and of course, Sarah Hasmer. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, and like I said, this is such a pivotal moment in history. We have an administration, we have people in opposition who believe that we are separated, we're segregated as a religious community, as an LGBTQ community. And we are here in this moment where, you know, we have to stand up and say, you know what, we are the same community. We are, we are a unified and, we're, um, and we stand together in solidarity. And that, I think that is very powerful. And I'm really looking forward to what our panelists are gonna say today. Um, Cause I mean, we're just gonna be in strength and numbers. And I hope you come out of this briefing, um, very motivated to submit your own comment because your voice really does matter. Um, and I hope you also encourage your neighbors, you, the, 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 the folks that you go to church with or the folks that you go to whatever religi religious entity that that, that you, you're part of, uh, I hope you go and encourage each other to submit comments because um, we really need to look out for each other. So I'm really looking forward to this. And uh, again, thank you so much panelists for being here. I'm gonna um, pass, pass it on to Sarah Hasmer um, for more information. Hi, I'm Sarah Hasmer, Senior Counsel for Income Security at the National Women's Law Center. 
I want to say thank you to Americans United, Cap Space and Progressive Policy Institute, or excuse me, initiative, uh, the National Center for Transgender Equality, and um, also the United Church of Christ, who I'll reference later their relationship to this briefing. Um, it's it's really exciting to be here with you today, though on a sad um, note. I'm also humbled to be part of such an amazing group of panelists. So here's some background about what we're talking about today. In 2016, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, aka HUD, released an equal access rule that mandates that HUD-funded shelters provide access to people based on their self-identified gender identity. This equal access rule prohibits shelters from taking taxpayer dollars in one hand and then turning trans people away in the other to live on the street. This is super important given that according to NCTE's US Transgender Survey, nearly one third of trans and gender non-binary people experience homelessness in their lifetimes. That stat rises to nearly half of trans and gender non-binary people of color. Unfortunately, the current Secretary of HUD, Carson, is trying to promote his transphobic agenda and his animus through a new proposed rule, which would cause harm in two core ways. So first, it would allow HUD-funded shelters um, that are single-sex shelters to create an accommodation policy based on biological sex. This would promote discrimination against transgender people, which the Supreme Court recently said in Bostock is a form of sex discrimination. Second, it would let shelter providers make a quote unquote, good faith assessment of an individual's sex based on physical characteristics like height, the presence of facial hair or an Adam's apple or other physical characteristics. This is flat out sex stereotyping and would harm any woman who doesn't meet the provider's idea of what a woman looks like. Um, and in this proposed rule, HUD claims the 2016 Equal Access Rule presented an undue burden on shelters with religious convictions. Yet no shelter whatsoever has requested a religious accommodation from that 2016 rule. So it's not an undue burden to take taxpayer dollars to provide shelter services and serve unhoused people in need. Secretary Carson, unfortunately, is also promoting misinformation and absurd hypotheticals about the safety issues that are at risk. Abusive men do not need to dress up as women to attack women. Sadly, far too many men presenting as men do this every day. This fear stoking from Carson seeks to pit trans women against cisgender women survivors. But trans women pose absolutely no security risk to cisgender women. The security risk happens when shelters turn away trans people. In a recent CAP survey that was just released, 87% of trans respondents said it would be difficult or impossible to find an alternative shelter if this proposed rule goes into place. Also, recent data from the National Alliance to End Homelessness shows how unsheltered trans people experience higher rates of disability, chronic illness, HIV, and self-harm compared to trans people with access to reliable emergency shelters. Failing to provide shelter also increases the risk trans people will interact with emergency services and law enforcement, including a heightened risk of being funneled into a prison system that far too often does not accommodate trans people based on their gender identity and creates an environment for sexual trauma for them. Moreover, the American Medical Association has declared violence against Black trans women a nationwide epidemic. Oh, and yes, we're also in a nationwide pandemic where people experiencing homelessness face a higher risk of contracting COVID-19, needing to be hospitalized, and dying from COVID. So instead of permitting more discrimination against trans people, HUD should focus on addressing discrimination trans people already experience in the shelter system. 
According to the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, 26% of those who experienced homelessness in the past year avoided staying in a shelter because they feared mistreatment as a trans person. 70% of those who did stay in the shelter reported mistreatment, such as harassment, sexual or physical assault, or being kicked out because of their gender identity. This is a discrimination that we must tackle, not promoting discrimination. I'm a United Methodist, and one of John Wesley's three general rules is to do no harm. I even have the t-shirt. Unfortunately, this proposed rule, if finalized, would cause even more harm to trans people and any woman seeking shelter who doesn't meet a stereotype look for a woman. We need people of all faiths to raise awareness of this issue and take action because housing saves lives. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that you gave us context um, to set up this conversation that will happen with our credible um, um, panelists right now. Um, it's important that we know the details and know the impact and implications of this proposed rule. So with that, I would like to um, introduce our um, panelists. Uh, we have with us, you have already met Sarah with um, the National Women's Law Center, but we also have with us Reverend Cedric Harmon, who is the Executive Director of Many Voices, um, along with Reverend Alex Patchen McNeil, who is the Executive Director at More Light Presbyterians. And we have with us Reverend Cherise Scott, who is the founder and CEO of Sister Reach. So thank you all for joining us today for this conversation. Um, I start by asking the question, I mean, uh, Sarah has given us a lot of context and a lot of background information. Um, she talked about homelessness, mass incarceration, sexual trauma, and then not to mention um, even death for some. Um, so with that, I, I'm curious to know what brings you into this conversation today? Je Debbie, thank you for joining us back on. Um, thank you for, um, what brings you into this conversation today? How do you enter into, into this conversation about LGBTQ rights and housing for transgender people. And so we'll start with uh, Reverend Cedric. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dent, and uh, greetings to all of my uh, additional panelists, friends who are joining and to you that are joining and watching this briefing. It's an important conversation. Uh, as the executive director of Many Voices, a Black Church Movement for Gay and Transgender Justice, LGBTQ Justice, the primary audience and constituency of our work is LGBTQ people and their families. Uh, special emphasis on Black LGBTQ communities, and housing is a basic human need. Can we just agree that housing is a basic human need? Data indicates that housing assistance, Medicaid, and unemployment benefits are critical for LGB LGBTQ people's economic security. Housing discrimination is a cruel attack on one's personhood, their ability to thrive, and their ability to survive. Black people make up a disproportionate share of those that experience uh, housing insecurity. 40% of the homeless population, despite representing only 13% of the general US population. And new data shows that this pandemic is widening housing disparities by race and income. So during a pandemic, people experiencing homelessness face increased exposure to the virus. So it is important to me to talk about this proposed rule that would augment and advance the already existing experiences of discrimination in our world and in our society, especially experienced by Black people, especially experienced by LGBTQ people, and especially experienced by young trans women of color. So this is an important issue to me because I care about people and as a minister of the gospel, I have to care about housing insecurity. Thank you, Reverend Cedric. Reverend Alex, can you jump into this conversation, please? Hey, everyone. Great to be with you all this afternoon on this really important um, topic and conversation and way to take action. So I am Reverend Alex Patchen McNeil, and I entered this conversation first as a human, as a transgender man, as someone who has navigated spaces where I didn't know if I'd be able to enter or if I'd be turned away at the bathroom door, 
the gym locker room door, the classroom door. There have been years in which my gender presentation would have been insufficient to uh, render me as male and could have been dangerous if I had been read as female. And so I carry that knowledge in my bones and I never forget it, even as now I might pass some sort of external test as, uh, as someone who is male. Even if you were to look at my birth certificate, you'd find something different. So I enter this conversation first as a human and with the knowledge that so many of my transgender and non-binary and gender non-conforming siblings receive the kind of mistreatment and dehumanization that sometimes feels unfathomable. And as someone who is white, I know that I am also protected in a way from much of that discrimination. But my empathy and sympathy um, in my bones for what trans people experience compels me and uh, my faith encourages me to speak out against this level of discrimination. It's unchristian and I believe it's antithetical to every single faith tradition to deny someone housing based on who they are. And so that's what we're being asked to do with this rule for a way for shelters to turn people away. And we know that transgender people and those who do not match the gender presentation they're supposed to have, whatever that means, um, will be turned away at such a high rate. So I enter this conversation with conviction that people of faith have a huge role to play in helping to make sure this kind of damage doesn't happen. I live in North Carolina and I moved back to my home state of North Carolina just two weeks before House Bill 2 was passed back in 2016, which those of you who may remember prohibited people from entering restrooms or accessing facilities if they're, uh, they, they did not match their quote biological sex. And it, the House Bill 2 was much worse than that, but that was the kind of headline of the law. And what shocked me and amazed me was that as soon as House Bill 2 was passed, which again, unconscionable, unchristian, so many faith communities called me up as executive director of Morelite with a background in training and advocacy around trans issues in particular, and asked me, what can we do? How can we stand against this horrible law? How can we make sure the governor and the legislature knows that this is not gonna happen in the name of our faith? So I think our faith communities have such an important role to play, and we can talk more about that later, in standing against um, inhumane treatment against who God loves. So I'll pause there. Thank you, Reverend Alex. Reverend Sharice, can you come into this conversation with the work that you do with Sister Reach? Tell us more. Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much for having me and having Sister Reach be a part of this important conversation. Uh, I am excited to enter into this conversation as an ally uh, and not one who claims allyship, but one who has been invited in this particular conversation and understands that allyship is uh, what you are named, not what you name yourself. Uh, and so definitely the work that we're doing down here in Memphis, Tennessee with our Boy Talk program that services masculine of center, women of color and trans men of color, uh, as well as holding reproductive and sexual justice at the core of the way that we do our work uh, with faith-based organizing as an important key strategy of how we achieve our work. Uh, understanding that we, you know, we're navigating this world like every other human being, and we understand uh, the importance of doing no harm as an organization, as cisgendered women here, uh, but also trying to create opportunities and space for others, uh, which I believe is our reasonable service to humankind, right? I also identify coming to this conversation as a woman who is also queer. And so this is also my reasonable service to my trans brothers and sisters and friends um, who are experiencing an, inc an incredible amount of Christian terrorism. Uh, folks who have hijacked Jesus, folks who have taken Jesus and weaponized Jesus against the least of these, the most marginalized people. Uh, and though we may not all necessarily enter into this conversation from a Christian conversation, I do. And I believe that everything that we are experiencing, especially down here in Tennessee, uh, where much of our legislation is crafted by folks who claim to love the Lord, uh, however, continuously push folks to the margins, continuously do harm, and what I call Christian terrorism, right? Uh, fueled by this need to maintain power, this need to, um, uh, to maintain whiteness, to, and, and use wh white supremacy, right? And, and, and try, to, try to cloak white supremacy um, with Christianity 
which isn't okay for us, is which isn't okay for me as as a woman uh, who is you know believes uh, in the ministry of Jesus, who didn't leave anybody out, right? Who reached for those that others were turning away, who advocated for those um, uh, who you know desired just to be uh, accepted, right? In in the in humankind as a human being, and so I just think that that's our work. Uh, in the world as people, right? And so we are, uh, like I said, excited to be a part of this conversation, but also understand, as others on the panel have said, that not only is housing um, uh, something that every human being should be afforded, it's a human right. And so we are a human right based, we are a human rights organization. And that also includes the, the human rights of folks who identify uh, as trans. Thank you so much, Reverend Sharice. And Debbie, uh, would you like to weigh in and share how you enter into this conversation? Your work is very critical with what you do at the National Center for Trans Transgender Equality, but I don't take for granted your reason for being a part of this conversation today. Yeah, um, you know, I've, you know, been part of the, you know, very, I think the trans community is so, such an important community for me. And we're such, you know, in terms of trans rights, you know, it's just been recent in our history that we, you know, we have been seen and we have been given rights and the Obama administration has been, you know, quite frankly, the first administration that recognized us as a community. Um, you know, and we were, you know, we were given, you know, we were given that recognition. Um, and I think it's very devastating that this current administration sees us as, uh, as, you know, as not human and you know and and what's really frustrating is that you know in the larger part of the lgbtq community i in i have many friends who are super religious i have many friends who are religious leaders themselves and so it really you know it, it gets a sense of like we're being weaponized um for a specific political agenda and um and i and i have a lot of friends who are queer who are trans who are religious, who feel like they their their faith and their personal journey and their spirituality is used as an excuse for hate. And and it's it's quite frankly ridiculous that we especially given this current age after you know after we saw marriage equality passed, after we we we've taken a lot of major strides, especially within the trans community, to see us to see uh, the politics that we're seeing now kind of reverse back to the times where we um were hiding in closets um i don't i just don't want to see that and i don't want it and then i don't want that for my community and especially my religious friends um you know we're in a moment where you we, we should we're in a moment where we need to stand up and speak out and say you know what this is not okay um it's it's not right and um and you know we we don't allow that we don't tolerate that kind of hate Hatefulness, especially among the, uh, especially among communities that don't have housing, and especially especially during a pivotal moment like the pandemic, where people are dying, uh, and, you know, and not only is it putting trans people in danger, it's putting all women in danger, and it's putting the it's putting society and the public in danger as well, and so I think these are one of those moments where we have to set stand up and say, you know what. That, that's not right. And we need to be outspoken. We need to participate in our civil, civil duties and our civil rights. Thank you so much, Debbie. So I want to raise this question. And Sarah, I'm looking at you because you're the next person I'm going to call on. I want to raise this question because all of you have talked about, for the most part, um, your religious uh, beliefs and how they, they shape why you're speaking out on this particular issue. So I want to know what's at stake if we don't continue to raise awareness about this issue, what's at stake if any one of us stop talking about it or getting on the nerves of this administration um, by saying this is wrong, this is inhumane? Uh, Sarah, what's at stake for you um, as you enter into this conversation? What's at stake if we stop talking? What's at stake if we stop doing the work? Well, HUD has to go through what's called a notice and comment process. And that means that HUD staff have to read every unique comment that's submitted. So silence means that HUD staff won't consider your perspective in making if it ever comes to be a final rule. 
I'll also say um, the more comments that we submit, the longer it will take HUD staff to actually have to read all of those comments. And if we remain silent, that's one less argument that we have if there is a final rule and we pursue litigation to try to stop a final rule from going into effect. That means that that voice, your, that perspective won't be in there. And numbers matter. Um, I also, in addition to work on housing, I also work on food assistance. And there was an earlier rule in this administration to try to take SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, away from hundreds of thousands of people. And a district court judge, thankfully, uh, granted a preliminary injunction, that's lawyer speak for essentially blocked it from going into effect. And in that decision actually cited the more than 100,000 comments that the public submitted vastly in opposition to the proposed rule. And so really being silent on this means that harm could happen sooner. So that's why it's really important for people of all faiths to speak out. And coming from my background as a United Methodist, we have the first rule to do no harm, but Wesley's second rule is to do good. And so that's why we need folks to not be silent, to spread the word, and also to um, submit a comment so that we can uh, stop this proposal from ever coming to fruition. Thank you. Reverend Alex, uh, what do you say? Like, what, what's at stake? What, what happens if we stop talking? Like, I think um, I really appreciate it, Sarah, just the, the background behind um, what happens when you submit a comment. Sometimes it can feel like you're, all, you're submitting a comment to nowhere. But I think there's another thing at stake, too, which is we have an opportunity as people of faith, as we raise our voices for and with trans lives, to share the good news of our faith that trans people are beloved and claimed and created by um, God or whomever our, our deity that we claim is. And I think um, when we can do that more visibly and openly, trans folks, and I know that from my own experience, take notice. And I think that's a huge opportunity and something that's at stake is by remaining silent that trans folks won't receive that message and will continue to believe in the, I, I think, uh, Sharice, you said it very well, the, the Christian terrorism that has um, been unleashed on LGBTQ folks uh, across this country. So that's another huge thing that's at stake that we have an opportunity right now to share our voices for. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Reverend Sharice, uh, did you have any thoughts as, you know, you talked about this Christian terrorism and, and what's at stake, right? What's at stake when people don't speak up about Christian nationalism, white Christian privilege, and the way in which it's like coming out right now in these policies? What, what happens? Yeah, I put up one of my favorite uh, quotes by Zora Neale Hurston. If you're silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say that you enjoyed it. And one of the things that I've been continuously trying to push um, from not just folks who are Black, right, but for folks who are Black and queer, uh, for folks who are queer, period, who are also people of faith, is that you absolutely cannot allow anybody to hijack God from you, right? We've got to stand in our power as people who love uh, one another as people who are same gender loving, who, as people who are non-binary, as gender non-conforming people, we've got to be able to stand in our power in, 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 the, in the path that we, that we have chosen, and especially for those who are Christian, right? We've got, to, we've got to stand up because it's not just, you know, it's not any, you know, various faiths that are against the queer community right now. It's very specifically Christian folk who are, 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 you know, using and weaponizing biblical scripture, weaponizing Jesus' ministry, uh, uh, taking Jesus out the equation and putting Paul in the equation, but I'm not going to go all there, you know, <laughs> for trying to push that off as something that Jesus would do, right? So I, I think that it's really important, and I've I even said this about my colleagues in the RJ movement, like it's too many of us who are people of faith to continue to allow folks who also claim to love God, uh, to harm folks in such a way and not push back on that level of hypocrisy. We've got to call it out. We've got to be just as unapologetic. 
We've got to be just as loud. What, what's at stake is that somebody's going to hijack the moral high ground as if it is all right for them to do that, right? And if nobody is pushing back, if nobody is saying, no, no, you don't get to hijack God from me. This is what I believe. And this is, you know, and this is why we fight, you know, trying to figure out our way in how we work with and through the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. We've got to figure out a way, right, to not allow people to fully hijack um, our, our political rights uh, in, that, uh, that intersect our religious rights, right, that intersect our human rights. We've got to be able to, to be, you know, to, to push back on those, you know, those very um, egregious actions uh, of folks who, who really believe what they believe. And that's the thing, you know, whether it doesn't matter, you know, in my work, we talk a lot about abortion rights, uh, those types of things, you know, but because nobody is pushing back and saying, I'm a Christian and I've had an abortion and you don't get to tell me I'm wrong or I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm, and I'm queer and you don't get to tell me that I'm going to hell because I'm not, you know, we're not using that theological power that we have. We're not using, uh, you know, that God-given authority that we were, our birthright that we were born with. And because we are not doing that, you know, it's making it seem the only voice that's being heard is the one that's damning everybody on this call to hell. The one that's being heard is the one that's damning all of us to this existence that, that, that separates us from God's love versus, you know, um, uh, you know, offers us this opportunity that's not even, you know, something that a person can control, give or take. That's the other part of this. We've given humans too much control over other humans about whether or not God loves us or that we love God. We just can't allow that. And so even down to something, I know that that's, you know, that's maybe going off into the weeds of a religious conversation. But what I'm saying is, is that the, at the very crux of it is that it's, it's being religion that's being used against us. So you don't get to take my housing from me because you don't think, what, that I deserve it? We're all supposed to do no harm. Every religious understanding more than not has a do no harm piece, right? Be kind to the environment. Be kind to your neighbor. You don't get to choose who your neighbor is, right? You don't get to choose whether or not your neighbor is trans or a lesbian or a murderer or an adulterer, like you don't get to choose. You just, the only mandate is the love piece. So I think that what's at stake is that folks are gonna, you know, hijack this and it's gonna become uh, a dictatorship is what I see this becoming. It's becoming a Christian, not quite faux Christian, right? Dictatorship that we've gotta be able to push back against, not just as folks who are the, the center of the conversation in this conversation, we're talking about trans folks, but even those of us who are not trans identified fighting on behalf of our trans uh, comrades, we gotta be able to stand in the gap. We gotta be able to intercede in that way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Sharice. Reverend Cedric, before we move to Sarah, because the work that you do at Many Voices is so important to this conversation and it's so important to the lives of transgender people. And you talked about, uh, it was brought up about women of color um, who are often impacted by this. Um, before we move to Sarah to tell the religious leaders how they can take action, I want you to weigh in because, and talk about like uh, your religious beliefs and what compels you to this and why, why in the work that you do, are you compelled to continue to speak out every day on this issue? Thank you, and, and it's been a really wonderful conversation so far, and I'm looking forward as we wind down to what's to come. So spiritual folks, and also folks, people of conscience, they may not identify as Christian or any particular faith tradition, but they are people of conscience, must be concerned and should be involved in matters of housing justice and in matters of justice writ large. So to go to scripture, my spiritual uh, tenets, look at this, the narrative around the birth of Jesus. What we notice about the birth of Jesus is that as the family is blossoming and about to come into fruition, they arrive somewhere and there's no room for them to enter and find shelter. It's right there in the immediate narrative around Jesus how important shelter is for someone who needs shelter in a dire situation. And in that narrative, they're given at least covering a manger, at minimum covering. 
So emergency sheltering is essential to the Christian narrative around Jesus. Let's go further. Let's look at the fact that there's this narrative around who is the neighbor. We call it the Good Samaritan narrative. Here is someone who has been harmed, in pain, and left by the side of the road. And what happens is the pain is addressed and that the person is placed on a donkey and taken somewhere to be housed and this unsuspecting, unwitting person pays for the housing for at least a month. So again, shelter is essential in the Christian narratives. But let's go to Jewish tradition. Throughout Hebrew Bible, people are wandering around trying to find somewhere to call home. Homelessness is in the, in the biblical narrative. And then if you go beyond the Bible, we know again that shelter and food and clothing are essential for every human being and actually for all creatures. The birds have nests. The fish have the sea to swim in. This is an essential part of human experience. So all spiritual people and all people of conscience must be concerned about this particular proposed rule, but about justice and the full thriving of all humanity. And we should be engaged in assuring that, advocating for that, fighting for that in every way possible at all times. So that's why I care about this issue. And that's why I do the work that I do because anything that subtracts from the full potential of all human beings to be realized is anathema to me and I must confront it and we must confront it day in and day out. Thank you, Reverend Cedric. So I, I want to lead us into the next steps of what we what can be done. But before we do, I want people to reflect on these words by uh, the a womanist theologian and scholar, Dr. Emily Towns, who said that when you start understanding, when you start with an understanding that God loves everyone, then justice isn't very far behind. And so with that, I want to invite Sarah to tell the viewers that are watching how they can take action by some Submitting comments to HUD on this important issue. Thanks so much. And I also want to quickly share that God calls me as a lesbian to seminary and also as a United Methodist to be a deacon. And one of those roles is connecting people in the church to justice issues in the broader society. And that also includes a lot of interaction with uh, members of other denominations and other faiths. So as I work on the tech, I'm very uh, grateful for the United Church of Christ put together this comment portal to make it very easy for people of faith to submit a comment. Um, all you have to do is fill out some information about yourself on the right-hand side, which is uh, pretty typical of a comment portal. And then the UCC and I already drafted some template language here. We kept it very broad, um, and so it crosses multiple faiths. Um, so this is where you can help make it unique. Uh, the general rule of thumb is your comment should be about 30% unique. So if you can just add like two or three sentences about your particular faith and experiences that you've had, um, and, and reasons why uh, shelters should not be allowed to discriminate against trans people, um, that would be super helpful. So like for me, for example, I would add in a few sentences um, about the general rules to do no harm and to do good. Um, if you do have concerns with anonymity, there is a way that you can submit a comment. Oh, sorry, I've got a hovering. Thing. Okay, uh, there's a way that you can submit a comment directly to regulations.gov. If you want to use the template language and modify it, then I just recommend that you draft your comments in that box and then just copy and paste it right here where there's uh, the comment box here and you scroll down and use this anonymous tab. Now, I'm also making a plea for faith-based organizations. If you work for one and can actually submit a comment on behalf of your organization, we have 
also this template comment that's just slightly longer than what we have in the public portal for individual comments. And we have prompts built in here to help you add some information about your particular organization. And we'll make sure the links are in the chat um, so that you have easy access to that. You have until September 22nd to submit your comments. And it's really important for people of all faiths to share and comment so our voices are heard. And so that while yes, there are folks weaponizing scripture, remaining silent is also being complicit and can lead to this harmful uh, proposed rule going into fruition. So please comment, it's very easy. I'm gonna stop my share. All right. And thank you very much, Debbie, for uh, sharing the links to those in the chat. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, for Sarah, for sharing that information and providing next steps for what religious leaders and religious communities can do to take action on this issue. I encourage people to click on the link now while you're on, on the video screen, um, but also we can send this information out to you. Those that are SVP for this program uh, will receive the links in the follow-up email that will come to you. Uh, remember, you have until September 22nd. Debbie, I see that there are a few questions questions in the chat bar there. Did you want to um, address some of those questions that we see? Yeah. Um, so the first one, um, the first one was um, from Gloria, uh, wondering if we reach out to the Jewish federations or if they reach out uh, to us about uh, sheltering issues. I think we have. Um, I think Sarah, we're part of a larger coalition of people submitting comments uh, um, to the federal regu regulations. And, you know, we have a lot of um, coalition partners and I'm pretty sure we have. I don't know, Sarah, what you think, uh, Sarah and Sabrina. I'm pretty sure we have talked to them and we reach out to them. Yes, there are a lot of different interfaith partners that are working with us on this. So we're not the only voices no. as an army of people that are addressing this issue. Um, and there are also people that we reached out to for the webinar who unfortunately were not able to participate, but lend their support and their voices um, because we recognize that it takes everyone to be a part of this conversation. Um, so we wanna thank our partners that we didn't necessarily mention by name um, that are also a part of the Faith for Equality group with the Center for um, American Progress, also those that are a part of the Washington um, Interfaith Group that are also pushing us forward and doing this work. So again, we have lots of partners that are working with us and making this possible. Thank Were you. There yeah, there's a few more. Um, someone asked, um, this person, I hope I pronounce this right, Karma, um, do you have legal counsel that will help other religious organizations who defy the rules to provide housing. For example, if there's a building that is empty right now while people are un unhoused, is there assistance for those groups when and if beco it becomes a legal issue? Um, I guess it, for this person, it seemed absur absurd that people need to stay home, but there's no housing, I agree, uh, while houses of worship are empty and not worshiping in living spaces, um, especially for trans folk and families. Now, I'm not part of a church. I don't know if anybody else has an answer to that question. Um, I'm, there is a lot of legal counseling happening. Um, I don't know if anyone has an answer to this. Um, I, I, I don't have an answer. I was actually trying to find the question in the chat, oh. um, but I will say that um, American United team is working um, hard to address these issues and we have a legal team as well as um, a policy team that works um, that will be working and addressing these issues directly. Um, so hopefully you'll stay tuned and connected with American United. Um, you can go to au.org to follow us to see more of the work that we're doing on this issue um, to protect religious freedom for all, especially transgender people, especially in this climate that's happening right now. Um, Sarah, do you have more information? The best lawyerly answer I can give on this is unfortunately, it probably depends. Um, I don't know what jurisdictions may have a requirement. I'm, I'm not aware, there isn't like a federal requirement for like, 
houses of worship that are empty to provide housing. I have been blessed when I have seen uh, houses of worship be able to use their empty buildings to provide some shelter to folks. And so would, have, of course, encourage in the following do no harm if churches do that. Please make sure that you are opening that to everyone, including uh, trans people and gender non-binary folks. Um, if you have a question about a particular uh, church, if you could just um, put that in, uh, there's a way to chat to all panelists, and then we can follow up with you after that um, based on some of our chatting with um, other housing attorneys. Great. Well, thank Great. you. After that, Reverend Cedric. Oh, am I correct in understanding that the current rule by in HUD is a proposed rule? It has not been fully implemented? Yes. So, so if churches or houses of worship were to house people right now, they are fully free to do so. They would not be violating this particular proposed rule, uh, but they should be sure that they are following all jurisdictional requirements around housing someone within their sanctuaries or places of worship. Yes. And also important to note that um, this is particularly impacting same-sex shelters. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, you're absolutely right. This, is, this, is, this has not been in effect yet. It's, it's just in the process of uh, collecting comments and uh, people's perspective on whether or not this rule should, uh, this rule should be removed or not. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time um, for our webinar today. However, I want to say thank you to all of our presenters, Reverend Alex, uh, Reverend Cedric, Reverend Cerise, to Sarah, to Debbie, um, to our coalition partners at the National Center for Transgender Equality, the National Women's Law Center, and the Center for American Progress, and of course, my colleagues at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Uh, we implore you and encourage you to take action. Don't just watch what you've seen here today and step away from it and not do something. We implore you to take action, to speak up, and to submit a comment. As Sarah stated, the deadline is September 22nd. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us um, at Americans United, and we will direct you to the appropriate organization that can assist you. But we thank you for being with us today, and we thank you for your time. And um, let's continue to stand together in solidarity and do the work that that uh, affirms the human dignity of all people. And so with that, I say thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.